Welcome to an exciting edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm Alexander Fleiss, CEO of Rebellion Research, with three principles of Measure Eight Ventures, a venture capital and hedge fund that's dedicated to the cannabis space. Now, this is a space that's absolutely blowing up. So guys, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, thanks for having Alex. Yeah. Now, we were connected by my old friend, Kevin Gallweiler, who I worked for about 22 years ago. So. Kevin's a great guy, really smart, and was kind enough to introduce you too. Now, you know, I focus on AI, obviously, and so cannabis is not, you know, my number one. But right now, is this market doubling, tripling? I mean, is this like post-prohibition type stuff? Like, where are we right now? I guess I'll, I'll start that off. Um, you know, the market is uh, continuously growing. Um, you know, every single year as new states are legalizing cannabis for either recreational or medicinal use. So the total addressable market uh, is doubling, is tripling. Um, currently, we're at about an $18 billion, $20 billion legal market. And uh, we envision that growing to $35 billion over the next five to seven years. Um, and eventually reaching a total addressable market of around 50 to $75 billion, um, with potential upsize to $100 billion as, as new product categories are, are um uh, created in the space. Well, how much do you see big tobacco coming in and competing with you guys for investments? Uh, Juan, do you guys want to take that on the, on the private side? Uh, I can uh, talk about the public side. Yeah. So, you know, I think we're in a, a really interesting time right now in cannabis where the regulatory environment is great for private funds like ourselves. Um, if you're a publicly listed company or an investment firm with significant exposure to institutional capital, the fact that it, cannabis is not federally legal is a barrier to entry at the moment. Um, so we don't foresee any entrance from the big players immediately. It's always a risk and we think we're all in this industry with the understanding that it'll, it will eventually be green federally. Um, and and I mean, with a Biden areas. White House, there's a high likelihood of a cannabis legalization over the next four years. So, you know, seeing that yeah. throughout the years, especially all these municipal, you know, issues, we've got uh, New York and many other states looking at uh, terrible budget crises. So the need for additional tax dollars is great. Can you guys yeah, give, and I just want a quick question. Can you guys give any, you know, a uh, color on what the cannabis market is versus tobacco? Is it the same size, bigger, smaller? The, to, the tobacco market right now is bigger than the, than the cannabis market. Um, you does that know, include think, the dark? Uh, I mean, does that include, you know, you know, illegal usage? So the thing about it is there's not really a great estimate of what the illicit market really is. You can do some usage statistics, um, incidence statistics, what a, what a lot of good uh, researchers have done and analysts have done. Um, and they kind of peg, you know, the global market um, around a hundred billion dollars. Um, you know, which is rivaling tobacco. Uh, we think that over time, you know, and you're seeing in other industries as well, as well there's a huge trend going on towards more health focused, um, you know, products. And, uh, you know, cannabis definitely fits in there against tobacco. So speaking from the vantage point of the avant garde, cannabis is a far more socially acceptable practice these days than is nicotine. So would one expect that trend to continue? And if not, uh, please opine. Yeah, I absolutely think, think that that trend is gonna continue. And that, that kind of goes into the, the health focused aspect of, of cannabis. Um, you know, I, I like to tell my friends and, and people that you know, are interested in learning more about cannabis that you know, there hasn't really been, I don't, not that I know of, uh, you know, any overdose from cannabis or anyone dying from overconsumption of cannabis. Yes, there are dangers with overconsuming cannabis, and especially with edibles that possibly you don't know what kind of um, how many milligrams you're taking. But if you take too much of tobacco, you take too much of alcohol, you take too much of any prescription guilt, uh, prescription drug that can kill you. And so that, that's not the same with cannabis. So I think that um, people need to refocus how they look at those other substances versus cannabis. Well said. Well, now you're looking at the public markets. So what's your favorite stock or two or three? Can you give to our viewers? 
<clears throat> sure. I, I have to be careful about what, you know, what we disclose in terms of uh, holdings and investments. Um, but I will just t talk generally about just generally. Yes. What are your favorite yeah, in the industry? Sure. So, so companies that we really like right now are the large cap, large scale, multi-state operators in the U S these are companies that have built up businesses in each, each state where it's uh, legal for to grow and sell medicinal and adult use cannabis. A lot of these companies have, uh, you know, built minority interests or won licenses in all of these states and have effectively ran separate businesses in each one of these states, but created a cohesive platform and organization across all their states and um, have built up huge first mover advantages in, the, in these states. And it's also, um, you know, the, the barriers to entry in each one of these states is extremely high, just given the license regime. So they're effectively you know, operating an oligopolistic business model in each one of these states. And, and the margins are incredible right now. We think that over time, the margins may come down, but building that first mover advantage really creates the pathway to building a national cannabis brand across the U.S. And I think that that's where the most value is going to be created in the cannabis industry over the long term. So right now, you know, British American Tobacco and Altria, um, you name it, Constellation Brands, um, Diageo, these guys can't build a cannabis brand across the U.S. They're, they're really, they're blocked from doing that. And who's, who is allowed to do that? That's the multi-state operators because they have the licenses and basically the distribution framework that's allowed right now in the cannabis industry in the U.S., which is the largest market by far. Does that uh, include Green Thumb Industries? Brand. Yeah, Green Thumb Industries is definitely in that, in that bucket of a, uh, you know, of a large cap multi-state operator. I know that was a... A company that was mentioned by a previous guest, Sean Stifle of Movie Capital, who was uh, another excellent guest that you guys have been. So, you know, we're seeing multiple views now pointing towards the larger players. While we're on the positive, can we actually just flip to the negative and talk about, is there anything you don't like because of this? I mean, you mentioned Diageo, British American Tobacco. Would you almost short tobacco while you long or cannabis? So, you know, over the, over the long run, the tobacco, the large cap tobacco companies, you know, will be the natural acquirers of companies like the multi-state operators. So from a risk arbitrage perspective, well, why not Pepsi or Coca-Cola? Them, them as well, for sure. Them as well. So, I mean, from that perspective, possibly you could justify them being shorts where they're going to be buying and you want to be long the, the acquirees. Um, so, but, you know, that's a very long-term trade. Um, and I think that it's not exactly an efficient way to express, um, you know, a, a pure long short in the cannabis industry. We think that there's huge um, valuation and fundamental differences between the operators in the cannabis industry. And so we think there's a lot of uh, alpha generation that, that can uh, happen over the next three years by just having a pure long short in the cannabis industry on its own. But um, to your point, I think that uh, can you speak to any of your shorts? Are you not com are you comfortable with that or no? I'm sorry. Are you comfortable speaking about any of your shorts? I can speak broadly about our shorts, but I, I'm not going to mention. Sure, whatever it. you're comfortable. Yeah, sure. So you know, I think that um, you know, there's 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 cannabis company. Cannabis is an extremely capital intensive business, um, especially in the U.S., where you have to build out businesses in each state. And to be profitable and to overcome the, the high 280E tax burden, you need to be vertically integrated, which means you need to grow the cannabis yourself. Um, and these, these facilities, these growth facilities are extremely expensive to build. So it's a high CapEx burden. Um, that being said, there's a lot of operators that are being rewarded right now in the markets for being a U.S. cannabis company that just, quite frankly, don't have the balance sheet and don't have um the funding needed to to keep up with the larger players so those are areas to focus on in terms of shorts um and i would uh, encourage anyone listening that's that's looking to short the sector or any companies in the sector um to a be very careful because you know the, these stocks are prone to double and triple on not really much fundamental news or fundamental events what about um, you know an out of work 55 year old male or female who's not inclined to re-enter the workforce, but has a decent savings, and he or she is looking to enter this market, how would you recommend that they go about doing so? I would, I would, I would, I would suggest going onto the company's websites, 
every single one of these companies have investor relation websites that are very, very good. They have a lot of information on there. I would take a look at the investor presentation that each one of these companies puts out on there. And as well as going on to CDAR and SEC website and looking at all the past financial statements, even if you're not that comfortable with, with all the different wordings and the different terminology in the financial I, I guess what I re I'm you really after though, stuff. Is, is there any way to actually physically enter the industry beyond buying the stocks? I mean, is there something you okay, would recommend people do? Actually, yeah, open absolutely. grow houses. What would you do? Is there the, what is the easiest way for barrier of entry? Yeah, there's there's great ways to 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 enter the space. If you want to work for the industry, there's there's great recruiting apps like Vangst, where you can go on and create a profile and, and get a job in the industry. Um, if you want to actually be in the business and start a small business yourself for for cannabis. I would look into states where there's, you know, more of an open, uh, open-ended license structure, like Washington, like Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma right now has got a lot of small business owners that are starting up cannabis businesses there. Can an Oklahoma uh, business sell to a citizen of New York State or no? No, absolutely not. So right absolutely. now, interstate commerce is not allowed because uh, cannabis is still a Schedule One federally illegal drug. Very important point. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys have been great guests. So should we cover some points that maybe we haven't discussed yet, such Absolutely. as you know, legalization? Do you have a time frame for when it actually will occur? When will this prohibition end on cannabis? Do you have a time frame? I'll let Juan and Bobby uh, give you their opinion first on this one. Yeah, so we never like to... I think invest or look at the industry with a clear timeline in mind of when regulatory change will occur. When? I think we, and we don't model that into our forecasts when we're, when we're looking at companies' financials, but what we do is, is adapt accordingly when change happens. So this last election cycle was really positive for the space. You had five states on the docket for some sort of legalization medically or, or medical or, or recreational. They all passed. Um, you know, I think having the presidency be blue is a positive catalyst for the space as well. But, you know, knowing that public sentiment nationally is polling above 66 percent in favor of some sort of cannabis legalization oh. is, is going to allow us to, to feel that some of these important legislative changes will happen. I think the, the biggest one to keep in mind is a banking act before any sort of straight federal legalization descheduling. I think that's going to be the most impactful for the space. People will be have access to institutional capital, banking services, you know, sort of Banking small. services are a must for the space to really grow. Absolutely. It's, yeah. it's the biggest thing for us, at least in the near term. You know, having a, a dispensary, for example, be able to take out a small working capital loan is paramount. I mean, that's not, they're not able to do that today. It's all cash handling as well. So some credit card processing is involved. So we feel like that's going to be the biggest near term legislative catalyst is a banking act. Awesome. Well, you guys have been great. Uh, stay safe, be well, measure eight ventures. What's the actual website that our viewers can go to if they're curious about investing in your venture capital or your hedge fund? You can go to www.m8vp.com and it'll give you a little bit of info. M8vp.com. Awesome. You guys are terrific right. guests. Thank you so much for the time today and stay safe during these awful times. Thank you very much. Thanks. Great day.